Mega Mechatronics. Welcome to the Mechatronics Bootcamp Series for Mechanical Engineering. Today we're going to be talking about materials, stress and strain. Throughout this series we're going to cover topics on stress and strain, ductility, corrosion, hardening and heat treatments, failure analysis, surface finish, and thermodynamics. And we're going to be covering stress and strain today. So let's talk about what stress is. The units of stress are expressed as a pressure, like the pressure in your tire, atmospheric pressure. So that's a f uh, force per unit of area. And the units are, here in the States, pounds per square inch, or KSI, which is PSI divided by 1,000. Or in the metric system, we have newtons per square meter, known as pascals, megapascals and gigapascals. So let's say we have this uh, material here, uh, this column, and we apply 10 pounds to it. So let's figure out the stress. So stress is the load of 10 pounds. We know that divided by the area. We're going to have to calculate the area. So here are some of the formulas. Uh, this is going to be a square, square rectangle, same thing, length times width. You see the triangle and the circle there. So here, let's uh, say it's a half inch by half inch, so 0.5 times 0.5 is going to give us 0.25. So we'll throw that in our formula, 10 pounds divided by 0.25. That's the area. And that's going to give us 40 PSI of stress within that column. And that's why something like a thumbtack can press into a wall so easily because that point is so tiny. And that will affect the formula here and increase the PSI to a very high number. And now we're moving on to strain. Strain doesn't have any units. It's unitless because it is a ratio of two lengths. So that's going to equal the change in length, delta change, divided by the initial length. And this applies to anything. You want to calculate the percent change of, uh, you take that uh, change divided by the initial. And it also equals stress divided by the modulus of elasticity of that material. So all materials are classified uh, with some sort of modulus uh, or Young's modulus, same thing. And you can see how we flip that formula around because Young's modulus is stress divided by strain. So let's take our sample column here and let's say we pull on this thing and we stretch it out a little bit. So we started with four inches and we stretched it 0 0.050, 50 thousandths of an inch not very much. So again, we're going to take that change. We're not taking the, the total length of that. Uh, so 50 thou divided by 4 inches. That's going to give us a strain of 0 0.0125 or 1.25%. So we change that length by 1.25%. And that's strain. So how are materials stressed? So here are the three basic ways a material will be stressed. So compression, where you're trying to smash that column together like you're uh, building a snowball, compressing it. Tensile, we're pulling on it really hard, like when you pull on a rope, uh, it's under tension. And then shearing, so you can see how those arrows are slightly offset, and that's the, the shear. So if the arrows were in line, that would be compression. And so let's say we have a beam, and uh, we bend this beam. So this is experiencing more than one stress, more one type of stress. It's going to be under tension up top and under compression at the bottom. You can see an example here, the piece of paper. See, it's going to tear at the top because it's under tension. That's typically how stuff fails under a bending moment like this. And you see how the bottom side folds up because it's under compression. So how do we measure stress and strain? The most popular way is a tensile test. So we have this test specimen, uh, a stand, it's a standardized size, and we put it in between two jaws, put a little gauge on there to measure the change in distance, and you pull it apart. So here's an example of a real life one uh, with some self-locking jaws there and you can see that gauge. 
So the specimens, uh, typically the flat ones, are uh, for polymer materials, synthetics. And then for the metals, we have a little bit larger piece there. I'll show you in this video. I have one on hand. Uh, that's a piece of uh, aluminum bar stock, and you machine it down and uh, to a standard diameter. So that's a half inch, and we can use that to compare against other half inch samples. And um, how you machine the jaws depends on the machine you're using. Some use threaded ends. Um, so that's quite important so you don't slip in the jaws there. So let's see how what we're measuring relates to the infamous stress and strain curve, which is really the point of this video. So we're going to take that stress because we're going to calculate the area of that specimen. So that specimen, the rectangular, we would find the area that way, or the round one, we use the uh, area of a circle. So we know the force because we're measuring it. And then we input the unit area. We're going to throw that over there. And for the distance measurement, again, uh, this would the, the computer would handle these calculations. The change in length divided by the initial length uh, between those measuring uh, little little measuring jaws there, and we're gonna plot that on the strain curve at the bottom. So here's that stress strain curve again. Looking at the bottom, you can see how the strain lines up there. So going across the top, that's about 400 uh, megapascals of stress. And we're getting a small amount of strain. And we're moving across to about 700 megapascals of stress. And you can see we, we have uh, significantly more strain happening, more, more change in length. And then we, uh, some materials will experience this where you require that same maybe 650 MPA and we're way over on the strain and then until it fractures and that's our breaking breaking strength right there so there's some important attributes to the stress strain curve that we need to understand first we have the elastic region and this is essentially the, the spring springiness of the material you can say the slope is related to the stiffness so uh, the steeper the slope the stiffer it is and you can see I have a piece of uh, steel wire here I'm bending it and it, it doesn't deform so when I put it down by the ruler it is still straight so we we stayed in the elastic region and that's elastic like a rubber band because you can stretch a rubber band and it returns to its shape and then up here is the yield point so we're beginning our little uh, hockey stick here and that's when the material yields it says hey I can't handle this and it starts to deform permanently in the non elastic region so you can see I have this steel rod again and I will uh, apply a stress above the yield point and then it obviously permanently deforms it and then at the end of this curve is the failure point so we have the elastic region, which is very important, the, where it returns to its original shape. And then we have the plastic deformation past the yield point. This is where permanent deformation occurs. Looking at uh, this graph to compare some different materials, we see A is very strong. B is very brittle you see there's uh, it, it doesn't even yield it just breaks and then C is uh, not not quite as stiff but it is quite ductile you see how far we had to strain it before it broke so stretching out like a like a piece of gum and then D is uh, not very stiff low strength uh, and kind of ductile so ultimate strength this is uh, something that you need to know and when comparing materials and looking up uh, material properties, this will be listed along with yield strength. So the ultimate strength is going to be the maximum stress that it experienced during this test. So you can see the different maximums here. So it's not just the breaking point. 
with B, the yield and the ultimate strength are the same, but you can see how uh, C continued after the ultimate strength, same with A. And this is what's so good about um, stress strain curves, that we can visually compare materials very easily here because uh, we're using stress, which is standardized uh, load per area. And then strain is a ratio. So we can take uh, data from some other tests and actually overlay it, even if they tested it in a little bit different way. And the various alloys, you can see the steels are up top, stainless. And then we're going down to aluminum, mild steel, and then magnesium right at the bottom there. Elongation, this is important. And I'll show you how that's measured. So before the, the, the specimen is pulled, we're going to take uh, a measurement of some known marks. So maybe we'll take a Sharpie. Uh, sometimes you, you can put a dimple in there or something. And then after the test, you can see how it is a little longer because it necked down and pulled apart. And then it failed. So we're going to actually put those pieces back together uh, after it broke and then measure that change. So it is uh, actually strain. So if you look at the stress strain curve and at the breaking point and then you go down to the strain you're going to see the elongation percentage there. So percent of elongation that's another uh, proxy to compare materials. And there's there's still other tests and I'm not covering every single material test here I'm just covering uh, the most popular ones. Here's torsional testing. So we take the torque that, and then calculate the stress and then the angle of change and that will uh, be part of the strain calculation. And shear testing up here. We can uh, test the shear directly. So we have our initial condition and then you see after the test or during the test while it's being strained it, it sort of cuts across there. Like you're using scissors, you're using shears to cut something. So here's a working example of uh, a bolt under sh a shear stress. And that's something you'd test for fasteners. You'd want the shear strength when uh, you're looking up a fastener that will be under shear load. And that concludes our stress and strain tutorial. Thank you for watching.